Lakeside is pleased to sponsor this exciting broadcast featuring Dr. Sandra Bloom and Sarah Yonassi on Voice America. Welcome to Creating Presence with your hosts, Dr. Sandra Bloom and Sarah Yanisi. Over the next hour, you'll learn about the processes that steer our hearts and minds and how to improve our collective social health. Welcome to Creating Presence. I'm Dr. Sandra Bloom, and I'm here with my colleague, Sarah Yanisi. Hello. Sarah and I have developed an organizational intervention to help whole organizations to integrate trauma-informed practice. And we use the word presence as an acronym. It stands for partnership and power, reverence and restoration, emotional wisdom and empathy, safety and social responsibility, embodiment and enactment, nature and nurture, culture and complexity, and emergence and evolution. Today, we're going to be focusing on the S for safety and social responsibility. We're going to do that this week and next week. So we're looking at each one of the letters separately and talking with experts and thought leaders in a variety of areas to help us expand our thinking and our work around improving collective social health. So this week, we're going to take a deeper dive into social health as it relates to the justice system and the ideas around developing a trauma-informed justice system. We work with a lot of organizations uh, who are implementing Creating Presence, and most of them, I think, would self-identify as part of the mental health system. But there's a huge overlap between mental health and justice involvement. And the common denominator is trauma and adversity. And that's because trauma and adversity cause all kinds of disruptions in the capacity to maintain safety, both safety for self and safety for others. But who is unsafe often determines whether people end up in a hospital or mental health system or the justice system. And trauma isn't usually seen as or treated as the root cause of some of these difficulties with safety. But according to most estimates, trauma is almost a universal experience among people who are justice involved. In fact, about 77 to 90% of incarcerated women uh, report extensive histories of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, either as children or as adults. And justice-involved women are more likely to have experienced physical and sexual abuse than male offenders or women in the general population. So SAMHSA and the Department of Corrections have um, asked the question, like, why are so many women cycling through the criminal justice system and wrestling with persistent mental health and substance abuse issues, unable to find footing in the community and reclaim their lives? Well, part of the problem is the very restricted definition of safety. So we know from all of our work with trauma survivors for many years, that it really is critically important to define safety in a different way. Yes, you have to feel physically safe, but that's not enough. People need to also feel psychologically, socially, morally, and culturally safe. But in the when it comes to the justice system, our immediate response is really to punish people who've broken the law even though research, an abundant amount of research has shown that punishment is probably the least effective way to bring about positive behavioral change. And since we know that most incarcerated people have high ACEs scores, it's a huge opportunity, like what you were talking about, Sarah, um, to, to really help people to heal. But doing that means shifting away from punishment and much more towards education and training and intervention and and skill building. 
Sandy, you know me well enough to know I watch a lot of TV. It's like my thing. Um, and I watched mostly police procedurals, you know, detective shows, all the NCISs, Law and Order, CSI, FBI. Um, and what's really striking is that all of these, even though I love them, um, really have a very narrow definition of justice and safety. Um, and usually that amounts to getting perpetrators off the streets. Um, but it really leaves out the social responsibility part. Um, we don't really get a look into what contributed to uh, justice involvement uh, for the perpetrator, how their experience with the justice system might compound or exacerbate existing trauma, and what happens when they return to their communities. And so in our model, in creating presence, we really try to recognize how safety and social responsibility are totally intertwined and that they apply to everybody, um, including the person who has you know, broken the law. So we spend a lot of time assessing safety, both at the individual and organizational level, and then applying relationship, communication, and safety skills, as well as helping create norms for managing accountability, um, because that's often where this conversation goes so wrong. And this is just what we think of as good trauma responsive practice. And that's because the overlap between mental health, substance abuse and justice involvement, you know, it just makes sense to apply them to this area of social health as well, these practices. And there's so many entry points that we could really, really help bring about change. Policing, courts, corrections, probation, parole, re-entry programs, juvenile justice, and, and ultimately prevention programs. That's, you know, that's really the point. Right. The um, before, during, and after pieces. So we're focusing on ideas around trauma-informed justice systems by engaging today in a conversation with Dr. Stephanie Covington, who, through her many publications and training programs, has been involved in gender responsive and trauma-informed services in the justice system for over 25 years. Welcome, Stephanie. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show with you. It's great to see you. It's good to see you too. Can you tell us a little bit from your point of view about how you make these connections between trauma, adversity, and criminal justice? Well, I think one of the things that you just mentioned is the very high rate of trauma that's experienced by those in the justice system. Of all the groups of people in our society, this is the group, the men and the women in the justice system that have the highest rates of trauma and adversity in their lives. And one of the things I've learned, particularly around working with the women, is over the years, um, I have asked in different countries tell me about which group of women in your country is most disadvantaged. And they'll give me a group of people, right? In this country, it's women of color. It's the indigenous first nation in Canada. It's the Maori women in New Zealand. And then I ask them, what group of women are overly represented in your women's prison? Those groups are always the same. So whatever group of women is most disadvantaged in the country, that's who you will find in their prison system which tells us something about the system. Now, I'm trying to change my language and I'm gonna suggest this. We call it the criminal justice system. It's actually the criminal legal system. There is no justice in this system. Hmm. That's, that's a misnomer. So we keep saying that as though that's true. We also call it a system as though there is a system. There's a federal system, there are 50 state systems, there's 18,000 local systems. And one of the jokes among those of us that do this kind of work, and we laugh say, if you're gonna commit a crime, think about where to do it. Because depending on where you are in the country, <clears throat> you will be treated differently. <clears throat> so there is no system per se. And I think the other thing that's really important for us to think about <clears throat> is, in our communities, when we're living in the free world in our communities, 
Our churches belong to us, our schools belong to us, our hospitals belong to us, our prisons and jails belong to us in the community. But these have been closed systems and we haven't looked inside. Mm -hmm. So for decades, we haven't known anything about what happens behind the walls, what's behind those closed doors. The good news is I think there's more interest now. And I think there is more interest in trying to figure out what's going on in there. Because if we don't look behind the walls and inside the doors, how are we going to work with people whose lives have been filled with adversity and trauma? Because we're putting them in places where they're re-traumatized. Okay. So that that's my kind of sense of the situation, if you will. So the criminal legal systems in most parts of the world are organized around very punitive mental models, as Sandy was saying. But your work takes a profoundly different approach to understanding and intervention with these populations. How do you find entry points and engagement opportunities to even begin this work and identify systems that are open to it because they are so closed? Very close. Often, well, they reach out to me, um, often not knowing what they're going to get. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and I take every opportunity I can to intervene and kind of up the ante. So, for example, um, because of my work, a system might say to me, gee, can you help us with our substance use disorder treatment for the women? <clears throat> and I'll say, sure. And then I'll say, gee, while we're working on helping with the substance use disorder program, we really need to be working with trauma because the majority of the women, and like you said, depending on the study, 77 to 90% of women are trauma. So we need to be doing both. You know, it's really going to be important for us to train your staff to also look at their own life experiences. And so I just keep literally upping the ante. You know, then let's look at the environment here. Think how difficult it would be to recover or heal in this space. And so it's just, I keep moving. Very, It's very unusual for a <clears throat> Ministry of Justice in England or Department of Corrections here in this country to call and say, you know, we really want to change our system. Will you come and help us uh, become... Uh, more trauma responsive. That's not what they usually call for. They want my expertise on women. They want something on substance use disorder. Now they'll ask about trauma, but it's usually they want, they don't realize how big the problem is in the system of what, what really needs to be changed. And even tr when I try to talk to them about it, so it's, it's a slow process, um, but it's, it's, it's maneuvering. <laughs> it's yeah. it's it's holding on to what is what is my goal, what's my objective, and how can I help move them closer to that? Um, and I've learned to be uh, grateful for small changes and false small steps. I remember you showing me pictures of uh, an environment where you were trying to do a group process with the women and they were in these chairs with you describe it it's okay secured housing units are where we put people in isolation um it's be, not because of what people have done outside the prison but what's happened inside have they been a threat to another prison resident or to staff so those are the folks that usually end up in a secured housing unit in this prison i was working in i was doing programming in the general population and the man in charge of the state program said could you bring your beyond violence program which is a program for women who've committed violent aggressive crimes could you bring that into our secured housing unit and i said well i need to go look at the unit he said okay and i went in to look at the unit and they had what they called therapeutic holding modules that look like wire dog cages and he said, each woman will be in one of those and we'll put them in a semicircle for a program called Beyond Violence. Wow. And I said, I can't program like that. So it took about a year to get a different environment set up so we could program there. But I refused to program with women in these therapeutic holding modules that think of a phone booth, a wire phone booth. 
that's what it looks like. Yep. So, so you know, and a change got made. So you know? we'll want to hear a lot more about the changes that are being made um, after our break. So we want to thank you for listening to Creating Presence. And we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Stephanie Cuffington right after these messages. If you would like your organization to be aligned in its values, practices, and skills to be trauma-informed, trauma-responsive, and trauma-resilient, Creating Presence is the program you are looking for. The Creating Presence model is an online and coach certification program authored by internationally renowned Dr. Sandra Bloom. This program is designed to help your organization become certified as a safe and value-aligned place for both your staff and clients. Creating Presence is managed by Lakeside, the host of this broadcast. For more information as to how your organization can create presence, go to creatingpresence.net. Lakeside, your resource for trauma-responsive care. Welcome back to Creating Presence. Sandy, Sarah, and their guests will discuss strategies and innovative practices for restoring our collective social health. Welcome back to Creating Presence. I'm Dr. Sandy Bloom, and I'm here with my co-host, Sarah Yanisi, and we're talking with our guest today, Dr. Stephanie Covington about social health, understanding the importance of safety and social responsibility in reforming um, the social justice system that maybe now we're gonna call the um, social legal system. Welcome, Stephanie. Um, what are the, from the points of, of view of, of that you've experienced, what are the nuts and bolts of integrating gender responsive and trauma-informed practice in justice and correction center settings? Well, you know, Sandy, I always think about the work on three levels, trauma-informed, and everybody's resonated with that term trauma-informed, and then you ask them what it means, and they have no idea. Um, <laughs> they just say they're doing it. So to me, there's trauma-informed, and that's educating people. That means we have information about trauma, hopefully an understanding about trauma. Trauma-responsive is how we take what we know and impact what we're doing, changing our policies and practices. So to me, that's being trauma responsive. And then trauma specific is putting the services in place, the programs in place for the people who are in this legal system. And in order to be, I believe, trauma specific, you really have to consider gender. That there certainly the gender differences um, between men and women, but also how do you be inclusive of the trans non-binary population, which is a huge issue in, in the criminal legal system because it's a binary system. You go into a prison according to the sex you were assigned at birth. So think about the issues of safety for trans, okay, let, let's, a trans woman who is now assigned to a man's prison. How safe is she going to be? Think about that, right? I mean, it's um, trans men who are assigned to a women's prison, but however, now in California can choose to go to a men's prison, six of them chose to move, which a whole other issue. So safety inside, you know, supposedly prisons were built for to help safety for those of us living in the free world. But of course, often people coming out in worse shape than they went in. So it doesn't increase our safety. That's a fallacy. But safety inside is a huge issue. So when we're doing trauma-specific work, we have to consider gender and the, the gender differences. Um, we have found that when we talk to men about male socialization, when they're taught, don't cry, don't show your feelings, pull yourself up by your book. So you can't be vulnerable if you're going to be a real man. And now we're going to talk to you about trauma. So what have men have done historically is shut down, not talk about it. And so we talk about socialization and how that keeps you from healing and how you need to look at these, what we call the man rules. 
pick the ones that work for you, let go of the ones that don't. So so some of these gender differences have to be taken into consideration with our trauma-specific work. When you're doing this work in systems, what are the results or outcomes that you're hoping to see? Well, we have we have quite a bit of research now on the result, the individual results in terms of being able to decrease depression, anxiety, PTSD. Um, people, um, the researchers that do this work look for empathy, uh, increasing empathy and the capacity for connection and emotional regulation. So we can see we have research both pre-post tests and randomized control studies looking at the impact of trauma-specific interventions. Where we don't have research is changing the environment and the trauma responsive piece. You can tell a difference in a facility that's moving in that direction, but that's anecdotal. But we don't really have the research on what we know makes a difference. And what the prison residents talk about when they're in a system that's trying to make some changes. Um, you know, one program I worked with, for example, here I considered this success. I walk into a prison and the correctional officers have made posters with um, uh, coping mechanisms and grounding exercises they posted on the walls. Now, to me, that means they've made a big step. Huge. But do we don't have research that says this is a big step? I but I know that's a big step. That's an attitudinal shift. And the officers, when I said, gee, these posters are great, he said, yeah, it was in a men's prison. We did it for the men, but we also did it for us because sometimes we forget our own coping skills. Uh, See? So yeah. now I feel like something's changing. I think right. this this is good. So you know, after World War II in the UK, there were there was a, a movement towards therapeutic communities, certainly in the mental health system, but also in the prison system. In your experience, do you think prisons could become true therapeutic communities if we would just provide the resource for, to have that happen? Theoretically, I think prisons and jails could be therapeutic communities. However, the foundation of this system is not based on therapeutic community. It, the foundation is based on punishment, on control. The way I think about it, Sandy, is, you know, you can have a car and you like your car and you've been maintaining your car and you've been driving your car for five years, 10 years, 15 years. Pretty soon the mechanic says, I can't keep fixing this. It's fundamentally falling apart. That's how I see our criminal legal system. It is so fundamentally flawed that keep focusing on reform keeps us stuck in what we have. Mm. We have to step back and ask ourselves a really, I think, we have to ask ourselves, what does justice mean? What would justice look like? We have to redesign. We have to transform this. And my experience is that maybe 10, 20 at the most percentage of the people who are inside maybe need to be in a secure custodial setting because we haven't figured out how to really help them. But the majority of people there do not need to be there. They can be in the community with community services and some level of empathic, compassionate supervision. Um, not what we do now. But yes, yes, prisons could be therapeutic communities, but we'd have to totally rethink this. Totally rethink this. Different. So not ours. what do you think it would need to look like? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, the idea of proposing more reform feels like trying to fix a car that's on its, you know, last leg and just, you know, needs to be completely, uh, you know, we need to start from scratch. What, what would that have to look like? You know, I think one of the things, let me step back. Norway isn't touted as being having a very good prison system, but the people in Norway, by the way, will tell you they only know about working with men because they incarcerate so few women. But in Norway, they have designed prisons that um, where the rooms look like a motel room, 
where everything is pleasant, trees, grass, um, the surroundings, everything about it is a And they'll tell you, at least when, when you talk to them, they'll say, well, we certainly know it's better for our staff because <laughs> the environment isn't hostile, negative, dirty, and, you know. So they have created a physical plant and have an attitude. You can ask a cab driver in Norway, tell me about your criminal justice system. They'll say, well, you know, people go to court to be punished and they go to prison to learn how to be a good neighbor. Wow. wow. That's, what, that's, what, that's what people in Norway feel about their system. That is a huge shift. This country does not have that attitude. Can you imagine people saying that? So what needs to happen is <laughs> not only how we build them and run them, it's what we believe needs to happen in them. We need to have places where people can live in community and learn how to be good neighbors. How That's do you think we ended up with this commitment to punishment um, on, you know, in, on both sides? In Norway, it's like you go to court to be punished, but you go to prison to learn how to be a good neighbor. In our systems, it's all about punishment. How do you how do you see that you know becoming our embedded way of thinking, and and how do we shift something so deeply embedded? I think each one of us needs to take some responsibility, and something we can do. This is a time of elections. Check out the voting record of the people you're going to vote for. What are they voting for? What's their belief? Because this is a political issue. This is a very large political issue. So that's one thing we all can take some responsibility for. The other thing that we need to do is we need to look around us and go and visit. You know, call and say, I'd like to come and visit whatever is the jail or closest prison to you and see what it's like to try as a public citizen to get into something that you're supporting with your tax dollars, something you're supporting by looking away, and um, you'll find that it's a difficult. And then you have to ask yourself, why is that? Why is this so closed down and shut? How did we get here? I think is very complicated. Um, I don't have an easy answer for you. But I think as a country, we're becoming more and more mean-spirited. We're becoming more and more the kind of overt hatred that you can hear and see around us is represented by how we are treating people with adversity. And what we do is we, we have decimated communities with our policies and practices, decimated them. And I can tell you that these are not white middle-class communities that have been decimated. It's very clear. And it is an extension of slavery in this country. This, this is our sort of outcome, if you will. Um, so I think we have to take some responsibility and really, as I said, step back and what does justice mean and what, what would it look like? But we have to change how we think, what we believe. Yeah, and starting with the, that fundamental notion of how silly it is to think that we're getting safer when we release people and things have been made worse for them when it was already terrible for them going into the situation. Right, right. And, and it's so short-sighted. A number of years ago, we did a big National Institute of Corrections project with looking at women and some ways of working with women and in some focus groups with women in prison, I asked them, what is it you needed that would have helped keep you, prevent you from coming in here? Education, child care, substance use disorder, treatment, domestic violence services, housing. Right? These are all the things we talk about providing in reentry, but we don't, but we wouldn't give them up front for prevention. And so for a lot of women, the crimes they commit are really crimes of survival, you know, and um, and then they end up in the system. Um, and if we had a system that worked, most of the people that are in the adult system started in the adolescent, started in juvenile justice. If that system worked, it would be a prevention, but it really is a pipeline. So we have, these aren't, this doesn't work. It's all around us. It doesn't work. And it's very expensive. 
And I think that that punitive behavior really originates a lot with the way we treat children. Mm. And that the, so the connection between the ACEs work and what's going on in terms right. of the criminal legal system is, is really obvious. That's where it all meets, right? Yes. Just, absolutely. just punish kids instead of understanding them. And then kids grow up. Yeah. A, f a friend of mine used to run the anti-spanking coalition in Sweden. He actually ran their, their alcohol policy division also, but he, he this was, and he would travel around the world talking about anti-spanking laws. He said in the United States is where he got the most aggressive pushback from parents about, I have a right to do this. He could not believe that that was what was believed in this country. Absolutely. So only country, only country in the world that has refused to ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in the world. Hell, see, th these are fundamental belief, values and beliefs that where it leads to, right? Yeah, that's why we talk about trauma-informed practices having to be a real paradigm shift, right? And that's what we're passing on to the next generations um, to to work on. Right. Um, where where have you seen the most success in the in the criminal legal system? I'm just going to take me some time to make that shift. Our wording. Um, I see pockets of things in various places around this country. Um, I've actually had some of my biggest success in England, where I worked with the twelve women's prisons, taking them through this process, and then they gave me seventeen high secure men's facilities to work with, and so we did three tiers, right? Training everybody, um, having them evaluate their environments and begin to make changes there, and then to bring programming in. And so, probably in terms of, um, I would say that's been very successful. Um, and there also in England is a really state of the art community based program that just opened for women a couple of months ago, very much based on this whole um, building and the apartments and the gar, everything in the place for the children, all constructed through the lens of trauma you know, about having rounded instead of square things, natural light, light colored, textured, um, just it's a beautiful environment. And this is an alternative to incarceration for women. And the children can be with their mothers? Yes, it's from women and their children. Wow. Exactly. Instead of this separating business. And uh, that's a huge issue because what that does is it impacts the next generation. Right. Right. As one woman said to me, I do my time, but my child's done time too, you know, because I'm in here. Um, so it's it's huge. It's you another know, place where prevention could occur. Oh, absolutely. And isn't, it isn't happening here. We're just making uh, more and more and more. Prisons. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. very unfortunate. I'm going to leave you with a quick thing. You know, everybody's always talking about getting out of prison. As, and it is for people who are incarcerated, this is the goal. But a colleague of mine who was formerly incarcerated said, we talk about getting out of prison, but the hardest thing is getting the prison out of us. Mm. Mm. How do we get the prison out of us? And this is true for people who've been incarcerated 20, 30 years. That experience is so embedded. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, we want to thank you for listening to Creating Presence. We just heard from Dr. Stephanie Covington. And coming up after the break, we'll talk with attorney Robert Reed and social activist and filmmaker Elle Sawyer. If you are a professional who would like to know more about how to provide care for individuals who have experienced trauma and adversity, Lakeside Global Institute can provide you with one of two intensive certification courses. You can be certified as a trauma-sensitive professional, which is a 50-hour online training experience. Or, for a deeper experience, you can become a Lakeside Global Institute certified trauma-competent professional through a live Zoom process that is 75 hours of well-researched and practically applied training. Lakeside Global Institute provides professionals with the highest level of training sophistication and integrity for you to be proficient in trauma-responsive care. 
You can learn more by going to lakesidetraining.org for more information. Lakeside, your resource for trauma-responsive care. Welcome back to Creating Presence. Sandy, Sarah, and their guests will discuss strategies and innovative practices for restoring our collective social health. Welcome back to Creating Presence. I'm Dr. Sandra Bloom, and I'm here with my co-host, Sari Yanisi. We're going to continue our conversation now around safety and social responsibility in the justice system or the 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 legal system um, with our guests, Robert Reed and Elle Sawyer. Rob was worked for 30 years as a U.S. attorney for the Department of Justice and then became trauma-informed. And he is currently serving as the Executive Deputy Attorney General of Pennsylvania, endeavoring to help the justice system in Pennsylvania become trauma-informed through his work with Heal PA. So welcome, Rob. Great to see you, and it's great to be here. And also joining us is Elle Sawyer. Elle Sawyer is a filmmaker and social justice advocate based in Philadelphia. Drawing on his own experience with incarceration, Elle speaks internationally on the challenges of reentry, recidivism, and neglected communities. He's won numerous awards for his film and community work, met with President Obama about criminal justice reform, and was named a 2016 Rauschenberg Foundation Artist as Activist Fellow. In 2014, he co-founded Media in Neighborhoods Group, a film company that specializes in the multimedia documentation of criminal justice issues in marginalized communities. Welcome, Al. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, the Criminal Justice Reform Action Team, right, released a 200 page report in December, 2022. And I think you were in charge of this whole thing. And you outlined 150 recommendations for the Pennsylvania criminal justice system. I know this is asking a lot for you to sum those up, but, but could you tell us, could you sum up those recommendations and how they relate to trauma and adversity? Sure. Uh... Well, let me just back up just a little bit and say that, so I am on the leadership team of this entity called Heal PA. It's an effort that was created five years ago to create a trauma-informed Pennsylvania. So the focus is not just on the criminal justice system, but it includes all of Pennsylvania and all our systems and hopefully all of the people who serve the public and the people who are vulnerable and need assistance and we can help them heal and recover from trauma and adversity. Um, within Heal PA, we have done a lot of work. We issued a report on creating foundations to create a trauma-informed Pennsylvania. And then in 2022, um, one of our action teams, which I oversee, it's the criminal justice team that you referenced, uh, issued a report, about a 200-page report that did include 150 recommendations. Now, just to put this in context, we came together with over 100, 100 people from around Pennsylvania, police officers, police chiefs, correctional officials, probation officials, um, people in juvenile justice, people focusing on prevention, judges, uh, you name it. But most importantly, as part of that group, people with lived experience. And we came together for several years and we came up with these uh, recommendations. They were in six parts, prevention, juvenile justice, uh, policing, courts, corrections, probation, parole, and reentry. So to summarize, if I had two hours, I would do that effectively. But the bottom line is we had a number of recommendations with, within each of those subject areas. So, for example, in policing, we are talking about actually educating 
all police officers, all law enforcement officials within Pennsylvania about what trauma is, what it means to be trauma informed, what is the impact of trauma on people who are actually doing the work that they're doing, because officers are exposed to so much trauma in their day-to-day -day work that they don't even realize the impact of what they're seeing each day. So the whole idea is, the first part is to educate the people with each, in each of these systems. And we're doing the same thing with judges, we're doing the same thing with correctional officials, with probation, parole, juvenile justice, et cetera. So that's a big part. And then the other thing is how to uh, create trauma-informed mm -hmm. systems. And I agree with Dr. Covington, there's not one system in Pennsylvania. For example, the Department of Corrections, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections oversees about 40,000 people, maybe a little less at this point, uh, people who are within many prisons across Pennsylvania. But these are people who got sentenced to two to four years or more of state time. But then there are 62, I believe it's 62 other county prisons in Pennsylvania. So these are all separate systems. They're not relying on each other. There are, just to give you an idea, Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is, has 121 police departments. They're all separate. Mm -hmm. So, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of police departments around Pennsylvania. These are all separate systems. So we are trying to reach out the best we can over time to educate everybody. And that is a huge undertaking. But, and so obviously if we can get to the leadership of many of these organizations, we can hopefully, and that's been our goal, is to explain why is this important? Why is it important for officers to understand that their own health is based in part on their understanding of this? so that they understand why it is that they may drink too much there is self-harm there may be domestic violence in their in their lives um they they may not really do well at home uh, and we see this uh, among police and suicidality among police for example is is very high relative to the general population so it begins with their own health care but it's not just about the police it's about how they treat the people they serve. And so once I believe police or anybody really allows themselves to let it sink in, this is common sense, of course this makes sense, then they, they treat, and I've seen it, treat people differently and they provide people with the kind of kindness, respect, and decency that they deserve as a citizen of Pennsylvania. So, I mean, I, I again, there are many recommendations. I've just summarized some of them. Yeah. I should say also in the courts area, um, you know, we, we have a very vibrant effort going on in Pennsylvania to actually, again, uh, educate all judges to create environments so when people walk into a courtroom, they really understand, that is the judges understand, that anyone walking into a courtroom, whether it is a lawyer, or it is a witness, it is a victim, or the defendant in the case is possibly a nervous wreck, maybe suffering a panic attack. They are scared to death because they don't know what's gonna happen. They may see the person who violated them or harmed them. Whether it's money or whether it's their uh, self, you know, the, the harm that's been caused to them, these are scary moments that we sometimes take for granted. So if judges can treat people with dignity and respect and understanding in a trauma-informed way, justice will be served. Right, right, right. If and people want to find out about the rep the full report, they can go on the Heal PA's that's website, right? right? That's right. And I can send it uh, to you so you have that. You can send it out. The, the one other thing I should just tell you, and relative to what uh, Dr. Covington was speaking about, um, the Pennsylvania Department of uh, Corrections, which again is one of the largest in the country, is embarking on an extraordinarily ambitious program to create, to be, I believe, the first trauma-informed state criminal, the state correctional system in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not going to happen overnight. All of the things that you heard from Dr. Covington are true in Pennsylvania as they are true across the United States. 
But the bottom line is over the past couple of years, they have made real steps. They've taken real steps to train essentially everybody within the Department of Corrections, serving in the Department of Corrections to understand what trauma is. Now, I believe that's phase one, and there's going to be many, many phases that are going to follow up because you have to change the mindset of what it means to be trauma informed, to understand that the people who are in prison, no matter what they have done, and remember, I was a federal prosecutor, no matter what they have done, they are human beings. And they may, and in my experience, everyone in prison has suffered from trauma and childhood adversity, that if they're given an opportunity to understand, that is the people who are serving the sentences, understand that they have been exposed to this trauma and adversity, it provides actually hope to them that they were not responsible for those injuries that occurred to them as children and that they're not worthless. They're not pieces of garbage. They are real human beings who can heal, can recover, and to go, go on and do great things. Rob, when you just said, you know, everybody in uh, the, the prison setting has been exposed to trauma and adversity, it really resonated with me in, in thinking too about corrections officers, the judges who put them there, the um, everyone in the system has likely been somehow touched by trauma or adversity experiences. And so in creating presence, Sandy and I focus equally on how we care for the people who are delivering the service as well as and as much as the people who are receiving the service. Yes. Um, L, I want to talk to you about uh, your TED Talk and um, yeah, fangirling. Uh, you talked a lot about how your friends and family were able to see the human um, and that was really a driver of your success after your incarceration. And it sounds so simple, but also really demonstrates so profoundly what it means to be trauma informed. And you draw on the contrast between your experience of just, you know, being a number um, in prison and then meeting President Obama and being addressed as Mr. L. Sawyer. What did you recommend uh, when you met with President Obama? What what about criminal justice reform uh, should our listeners know and support? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you both for having uh, me. And I speak for Rob too, uh, for having us. Um, no, but <clears throat> a re really interesting question. I, just backing up a little bit, just thinking about um, you know, the trauma informed sort of approach uh, with respect to PA or all of the places, you know, all the institutions that's happening. I think, you know, to, uh, to your point about seeing someone as human, you know, um, I think there's a very clear, you know, it's, it's, it's really clear that, you know, folks are taking on this step of trauma informed care or trauma informed sort of process by just applying it to their, their, their current and, you know, kind of learned uh, worldview. Uh, and, and a lot of times that doesn't seek down to actually creating a human interaction. You know, um, it, it's a lot of times it, it's, a, it's a box that gets checked and, and, you know, and that's it. When you're talking about, you know, calling someone an inmate or, you know, setting up these, these power dynamics that exist or the lack of acknowledging the trauma that is prison, the psychological experience that is prison on a human being. And let, unless you know, as much institutional change that happens, there's not one institution, there's not one program in PA or anywhere that I found that acknowledges and addresses the trauma of prison. Not one. Hmm. So, you know, until we get down to understanding that there's humans in prison, that, that's first. Not inmates. You know, there's, 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 there's humans in prison. Humans that, by and large, will come home and be your neighbor, right? Unless we understand that first, I mean, forget any other acknowledgement of all that, forget everything else, let's start there. And then ask yourself there from that point, how do you, how, do, how would we consider a human's um, 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 adaptation to this place? And then, can, and then 
how do we prepare them to then, you know, deprogram, de, you know, de uh, acculturate, you know, or or to acculturate back to society to be, you know, a, a brother, son, a mother. Um, and it's very interesting. Uh, up until now, we've been left to do it on our own, and we've seen the failure rate of that. It took safe places. It takes very safe places. Very, very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to have found, you know, enclaves in my life that's given me refuge, right? And these are real, this is really clear, right? I mean, we see this in the numbers, right? Where the recidivism rate is out of control, and it will continue to be out of control. It will continue. I mean, think about what we're expecting people to do. We got people, by and large, coming from impoverished conditions, like you have pointed out, traumatic backgrounds, by and large, going to an even more toxic space, being treated subhuman. Human ain't even, there's no humans there, like in people's perception and perspective. And not even just, you know, during prison. Okay, cool. You know, we can talk about that. We're talking about we have folks serving 30 years, 20 years, five years, whatever, told on a Friday that they're going home on Monday. Right? Like, we're, we're you know, so so I can give more specifics on that if I have more time. But just, just give an example of just like there's one thing is wordplay. And the first thing I want to hear about any of this is that there's humans in prison. And how do we address and how do we train our staff to understand? We don't have inmates in here. We have human beings in here. And then what's appropriate for a human being? and a human being's brain and understanding the brain function and adaptation um, that one would go through, man, woman, or child, um, whatever denomination or sex and race and religion, a brain in a condition, how does that adaptation happen? And then how do we adapt them or get them tooled to interact with them in a human enough way and tool them to basically be able to have the best chance at a, you know, socialization uh, upon um, you know, turning home? That said, you know, for me, like I said, I was very, very fortunate. Um, and then it's all luck. Let me just tell you, I'm the luckiest person you know. And it irks me to the day. And I have complete survivor's remorse that way because I'm no smarter than, than so many other folks. I've just been super fortunate. Um, and I attribute it to the hugs my mom gave me as a child and, and, and understanding that I had love and I had a nourishing environment enough growing up that I, despite whatever happened after that, I had a fortification in my myself that I understand what love feels like and I know how to express it. Um, that said, you know, I have folks, you know, that basically sheltered me, you know, from Lily A originally, Glenn Holston coming into the prison as a volunteer and teaching me film for six years. Glenn don't look like me, ain't from where I'm from. I never stepped foot into a high school. I still marginally can read and write. Like we're talking about very, 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 um, um, you know, I, I, what would have been a, a marginalized existence ongoing. But it, it, if it wasn't for love and support of people that seem past uh, whatever they were told. So something must be wrong with those folks, right? You know, and then, um, you know, and even folks in the call, Rob Reed, right? Like, you know, and, and, and Dr. Bloom, like we're talking about folks that have every reason not to interact with someone with my, you know, with, with, with my background. So again, when I say family and friends, I mean, we're talking about like, you know, I, I see my friends and family as life preservers. They, they've saved me, right? And then, and in turn, that's what I am and I feel like I am for other folks. When I, came, when I came home, it was Glenn and them that understood that when I went to prison at 17 years old until I was 25, I had already did two, two years in juvenile um, system prior to that and had never had a job before. You know, Glenn hired me despite, you know, all of the uh, kind of learning curves and things I had to go through um, in doing film. But also, I, you know, learned, um, I, excuse me, I also was employed at the Village of Arts and Humanities, a nonprofit organization in North Philly, which I credit, I credit for, for giving me a safe enough space to be and, and learn. Um, and then my family, you know, obviously knew me and, and basically, um, you know, had a lot of expectations on me upon um, returning home. We need you know, to when get, I met, Al, we need to get you to do a whole hour with us. Oh, excuse me. So that's our way. That's Dr. Bloom's very <laughs> curious way of saying, Al, stop talking. So anyways, <laughs> yes, I hope that answers your question. That was I, great. Yeah, yeah that's, it, that's, it, that's it. That's what we wanted. Thanks, Rob and Al, so much. Um, and thank you for listening. Join us next week uh, when we will talk to Bruce Shapiro and Dr. Elena Newman 
and look more closely at safety and social responsibility, you can reach us at creatingpresence.net or voiceamerica.com. See you next week.